So who can tell me why obesity is such a big problem? You could get high blood pressure, diabetes. Do you have to be old to have diabetes? No. You know what the main cure for obesity is? Who knows what it is? We do it every day here. Eat right and exercise. Eat right, exercise. In my school, I've seen a lot less like potato chip bags and candy bags coming into the front door first thing in the morning. I see a lot less kids walking in with a can of soda versus now I see them walking in with apples and bananas and that's key for me. How many of you worry about obesity in your families or in yourselves? My grandma, she's like, she has diabetes mm -hmm. and she gets really sick sometimes. Mm -hmm. So she has to go to the hospital constantly. My grandma, she got diabetes too. And because of her diabetes, she had a stroke. My dad is diabetic, so now all, I, all I'm usually able to drink is juice and water. <laughs> when, when your families go shopping, is it hard to find healthy choices for people who have diabetes and things like that? Yeah, you think so? Oh, to my mom, she thinks that apples and vegetables are way more expensive than junk food is. I dealt with obesity all my life. I mean, all we had was corner stores, cheese steaks, cheeseburgers, ice cream, junk food. And our dad died of heart disease and was a diabetic, and our mother's a diabetic. Our nephew's a diabetic. My husband has kidney failure. Yeah, kidney failure. He's on dialysis. Oh. But he's not a diabetic, but he got... My daughter's a diabetic And as she's well. the baby, the diabetic. Several years ago, I had a knock on the door. It was a young woman who didn't speak any English with a child in tow who was four years old um, who had just gotten some bags of food from the food pantry. And she explained to me that her son had diabetes and she put the bags on my desk and took out a bag of cookies and a bag of cereal that was all you know, sugar-coated something or others and a can of fruit that was in packed in syrup. And so she had nothing to feed her son. And I thought of all the people in our dining room that have diabetes and thought to myself, if this is what we're gonna feed people and this is how we're helping people, we're really not helping. We need to be addressing the quality of the food on that plate, ensuring that the folks who are eating that food um, have consistent access to good quality food so that they're able to lead healthier lifestyles. We don't have that much resources around. We only have the corner stores. What they have is the potato chips, the sodas, the junk food. The supermarkets are not close to where we live at. If you don't have a car, you don't want to walk because it takes about an hour to get to the supermarket. So it's hard for us to eat healthy and teach our kids the way you should eat. I'm afraid you have type 2 diabetes, which, as you know, is quite serious. Mommy! You sure? You're sure? You need to make some lifestyle changes as a family. Did he say what kind of changes? He did, and guys, it's not going to be easy. Say it, we'll try it. We need a new diet. Low carbs, low salt, low fat. We're trying to make Hellier House the healthy house, and so we're trying to see if it's possible for students to maintain a healthy diet while living on campus. I had always have an interest in nutrition and I like the idea of providing for people and to be in charge as a mother figure to the house and eating dinners every night as a family. In addition to having these foods, we also take them in the classroom and do class lessons with fresh carrots celery. Every morning when the children come in, they get their fresh fruits, the yogurt, the milk. We have some families whose children may be at risk. Diabetes is just a big problem for most cultures that are, that are in this area. The bigger kids sometimes they see the bananas when they're still green and they think at first sometimes it's the plantain but it's this banana. <laughs> are trying to put healthy lunches back into the schools without teaching the kids about the food at first. If they don't know what it is, they're throwing it in the trash. As part of the research component, we want to see what the families are doing and we want to see what kind of a difference this program is making in the end. He does mimic what me and his father does. If he see us with chips, he wants chips. But if I eat grapes, he wants the grapes. So it actually helped us start to eat better. If we look at children ages two to five, New Jersey has 
the worst incidence of childhood obesity in the entire United States. If you look at what this is costing us, it's costing us approximately $2.2 billion a year. That's going to quadruple to $9.9 .9 billion by 2018. There's no question, we have to solve childhood obesity. There's no magic bullet, there's no fad diet that's going to get us there, there's no solution waiting for us around the corner. We need to make fundamental shifts in how we address food issues in this country. It really does take multifaceted approaches so we can lean on psychologists, we can lean on dietitians and nutritionists, the food and agriculture people, everyone coming together to help achieve that vision. We have many opportunities for collaboration. Just from the project we've been working on doing community food security in New Brunswick, our community partner, Elijah's Promise, spelled out a project for us, and that was to map the urban agricultural potential in the city of New Brunswick. We have really talented community development students who are all thinking about urban agriculture in the city. I think high tunnels are one of the most important tools that a small urban farmer would use. To use a small amount of land over a long period of time in the growing season to get food to where people can purchase it and use it is really a multifactorial problem and farming and agriculture can't solve it on their own, nutritionists can't solve it on their own, sociologists can't solve it on their own. So there has to be a team effort bringing those kinds of people together with policy people to attack a really complex problem. This is why you need this interdisciplinary conversation because everybody has a perspective that's really important and that interdisciplinary conversation is going to take place at the Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health. Even modest amounts of physical activity improve cognitive functioning. I mean, if you think about it, you've got higher rates of oxidative stress in obese individuals. It's basically destroying brain cells. From a psychologist's perspective, the more you experience weight stigma, the higher the levels of oxidative stress. So there's a lot of invisible side effects of obesity. The creation of this institute provides us with an opportunity to bring people together across a wide range of disciplines. Coming at it from the perspective of social work, I'm quite interested in thinking about interacting with people in chemistry and biology, but anthropology, sociology, psychology, thinking about all of the implications that, that have to do with nutrition. We know we need to understand from science. We know that that science should not be one specific discipline. It also has to be informed by what the community wants, what the community is interested in, what community folks uh, do every day. New Jersey Institute for Food, Nutrition, and Health has the potential to do all of that, to be interdisciplinary, to engage the communities that it wishes to serve, and to develop a science base on how to make that vision um, achievable. Healthy people living in healthy places, in this case, healthy people living in healthy places in New Jersey.